Welcome back, Defenders. Jake here. So we've got to start with this story. Russia accidentally bombed itself. Blast rocks Russian city as one of its own fighter jets loses its ammunition. How Russia accidentally bombed itself two nights ago. An explosion caused a massive crater in the Russian city of Belgorod, injuring two people, wrecking homes, and severely embarrassing the Kremlin. If you've not seen the pictures and videos online already, this is what the crater in the city of Belgorod looks like. And it was a bomb accidentally dropped from a Russian Su-34 supersonic bomber, probably on its way to Ukraine to go commit some war crimes. And I'm actually surprised the Russian government is admitting to this and not trying to blame Ukraine. But there's just so much video evidence everywhere. Uh, car dash cam videos, as well as CCTV, all captured the explosion. If you want to watch this video, I'll link it down below if you want to see how big it was. And it was so big that a car was launched onto the roof of this building. Now, yes, two people were injured, nobody was killed, so I'm choosing to find this funny. And Ukraine would never do this. Ukraine does not target innocent civilians. That's what the Russians do. And apparently, while going through the debris of the first blast, they found a second undetonated bomb in the crater. The region's governor has announced the evacuation of 3,000 people days after the first explosion. And here's the picture of Russian soldiers with handheld shovels digging around a 300 kilogram bomb trying to get it out. It didn't detonate, but apparently two bombs were dropped. One went off and this one didn't, so good job, Russia. The other big news from this weekend was we had the Ramstein 11 meeting. Over 50 nations uh, now are participating, trying to find ways to help Ukraine. I do enjoy these uh, group photos with Reznikov making his way around the room, trying to get as many pictures with defense ministers, and heads of state as he can. And uh, what were the highlights of this meeting? Let me first share a clip with you of U.S. Secretary of Defense Austin speaking at the conference. In total, the members of this contact group have provided more than $55 billion in security assistance for Ukraine. That's a tenfold increase since we first met. Just in the past few months, we provided the equipment and training to support an additional nine armored brigades for, for Ukraine. And that has already strengthened Ukraine's position on the battlefield. So he's saying that these Ramstein meetings happening every month, this is the 11th meeting. And if we go back one year in time, only $5 billion had been given to Ukraine in direct security assistance. This doesn't count humanitarian or financial assistance, but in total, from one year ago, this is now up to $55 billion. And this group of nations, over 50, were all committed to helping Ukraine for as long as it takes in order for Russia to admit defeat. So five things you should know from today's Ramstein meeting. I'll tell you the two most important. And the first one is that the United States announced they're going to start training Ukrainian soldiers on Abrams tanks within the coming weeks. So initially, when the United States announced the 31 Abrams tanks they would be giving to Ukraine, they said they wanted to build them from scratch and then have them delivered sometime next year. That was not received pretty well by anyone. Uh, so the United States modified its plan and they announced they would be sending 31 tanks from their existing stockpile. So these tanks are going to arrive in Germany within the coming weeks. And uh, once the assets arrive, around 250 Ukrainian soldiers will take part in a 10-week course 
to learn how to operate and repair the tanks. So the training is slated to begin mid-June. Ten weeks later, this could be August, that trained Ukrainian soldiers with 31 Abrams tanks will make it to the front lines in Ukraine. I'm assuming then that a second round or third round of training will eventually follow. It takes time to organize and get the personnel necessary in order to stand up such a program. The other big announcement, NATO agrees Ukraine will become a member. All NATO members have agreed that Ukraine will eventually join the military alliance, according to NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. Now, Viktor Orban of Hungary immediately went on Twitter and said he didn't agree to this, so it can't be unanimous. But I do think that Ukraine has to join NATO at this point. It's the only way they'll get security guarantees where outside foreign investment will finally feel like they can return to the country. If Ukraine does not join NATO, then Russia will never stop attacking it. It's the only way to get security. Pentagon chief at Ramstein Summit, Russia's war not result, but cause of NATO enlargement. So let's do a thought exercise. Let's go back in time to the 1990s, and let's say as a condition for giving up their nuclear weapons, Ukraine stated they wanted a direct path to EU membership and NATO membership. What if, 30 years ago, they immediately got on the path to joining NATO? And once again in this hypothetical, let's pretend the Baltics decided never to do this. Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, what if they never join the EU and never join NATO? So let's now fast forward in time through over 20 years of Putin consolidating power and creating his authoritarian regime in Russia. What if Ukraine had just been a member of NATO for the last 15 years and the Baltics had never joined? Do you really think Russia would be attacking and invading Ukraine today and leaving the Baltics alone? It would have been the other way around. Russia would have been talking about security threats and Nazis and all this other nonsense in order to take this territory and connect it with the, uh, the territory of Kaliningrad. So what's happening here with NATO membership is every time a country joins NATO, that's one less country on the list that Russia can attack, Russia can invade. Russia knows that they would get their asses kicked if they went to war with NATO. So Russia deliberately only picks on and attacks countries not in NATO. And this has been the pattern for the last 30 years. Russian soldiers currently occupy parts of Georgia. Georgia never got into NATO. Russian soldiers currently occupy parts of Moldova. Moldova never got into NATO. Russian soldiers, for the most part, occupy the entire country of Belarus. Belarus is not a free and independent country from the state of Russia, which leaves Ukraine. If Ukraine had just managed to get into NATO a decade ago, then this war never would have happened. Nobody in NATO is threatening Russia. The only thing they're threatening is Russia's ability to expand their borders and attack their neighbors. So the solution here is everyone join NATO, build a wall, and keep Russia inside of Russia. No more expanding. But that's not what Russia wants. Russia is looking for any ideas, any justifications, any nonsense. And here is one of their most insane ideas. The largest class action lawsuit uh, about the collapse of the USSR has been filed in the Supreme Court for the Russian Federation. And this is what they're arguing. This is what they're hoping the Supreme Court in Russia will announce soon. So this is what this Russian lawyer is saying. 
If the breakup of the USSR is recognized as unlawful in courts, then Russia will have the opportunity to call off the recognition of Ukrainian independence. This way, the U.S. will be forced to get out of Ukraine's territory, and exactly this will reduce the opportunity of combat actions. This is insane, but I think Russia is going to do it in the near future. They're going to say in court that the dissolution of the Soviet Union was never legal, therefore it never happened. The new 14 independent and sovereign nations that broke away from Russia when the USSR collapsed, Putin saying, no, this was illegal, you, are, you all still belong to the Kremlin. Whoever sits in the seat of power at the Kremlin, which happens to be me, Vladimir Putin, I am the rightful ruler of all of this territory and all of these people. But when you combine these 14 independent republics, this has to be like 120, 130 million people. And the Russians are just going to say, you're fake countries. You're all illegals, and we are going to fix this problem with our military. Which is kind of shocking, because this would mean that the legitimate leader of Russia for the last 30 years was actually Mikhail Gorbachev. Gorbachev just passed away uh, last August at the age of 91, and maybe Putin himself said, was thinking, we've got to wait for Gorbachev to die before, before we do this in court. Otherwise, I, Putin, am not the legitimate leader of the country. This is so stupid, but definitely I think Russia is going to do it. And even the Chinese appear to be buying into this line of thinking. I don't speak French, so I don't know exactly what is being said in this clip. But apparently the Chinese ambassador to France, when asked about Crimea, had this to say. The former Soviet republics like Ukraine have no effective status in international law. They are not sovereign states. So what kind of mental jiu-jitsu can China do in order to support Russia's claims to everything? And now they might actually make the argument that all of these former Soviet states are illegal countries. They don't legally exist. So when Russia invades Ukraine, that is an internal Soviet dispute. It's not one sovereign nation trying to take the territory of another sovereign nation. It's an internal dispute within the Soviet country. The Soviet country that apparently now still exists. And there's no way, there's no way that if Russia somehow wins this war, which they won't, that they would ever stop with just Ukraine. They're going for all 14 former Soviet republics. And nightly on Kremlin State TV, they just broadcast that the Baltics are next. Ну, я не могу быть так убежден, как президент Беларуси, но в чём я убежден, это то, что Когда мы закончим денацификацию Украины, нам необходимо заняться Прибалтикой. Может быть, и не обязательно дожидаться завершения денацификации Украины, потому что все позволили эти нацисты, когда они 9 мая запрещают праздновать. То есть это страна, где реабилитированы эсэсовские преступники. При этом, заметьте, немецкая сволочь молчит, делая вид, что это нормально. Немецкие и европейские правозащитники не видели нарушений прав. So they're not being very discreet, telegraphing their future plans. They just say, when we're done with Ukraine, we're going for the Baltics next. The free and democratic people of the Baltics, they're all Nazis, they're a threat to Russia, and Russia must, for legal reasons, rebuild the Soviet Empire. I can't believe there are people in the West arguing in favor of the Soviet Union coming back. But I guarantee you that if Russia's Supreme Court declares these 14 countries illegal, people in the West who support Russia will just parrot that talking point. Another stupid talking point we all have to put up with. But why stop there? 
if all revolutions are illegal, you know, if the if if, if the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1992 was illegal, then the Bolshevik revolution that created the Soviet Union was illegal. We're going to have to go all the way back to 1917, 1918. And I'm sure Vladimir Putin would love this. Check out these borders for Imperial Russia. Finland doesn't exist. Poland doesn't exist. I bet you a Russian court could say, yeah, the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 wasn't legal. We need to restore our historical borders. Okay, so the Kremlin apparently pushed for a pro-Russia coalition with uh, members of Germany's government. This is according to the Washington Post. The Kremlin attempted to sway German politicians to form an anti-war coalition as part of a broader strategy to weaken European backing for Ukraine. So, of course, this failed. Russia's incompetent, but they did their best to corrupt the German government. I wouldn't be shocked if Money was moving around to influence some of these German politicians. But you can't tell something is true for sure until the Kremlin denies it. Kremlin spokesman denies Russian meddling in Germany's internal affairs. So we know it actually happened. And in response, the German government expelled some Russian diplomats. Moscow immediately replied, expelling more than 20 German diplomats. Let's check in on the front lines, and the city of Bakhmut continues to hold. (laughs) Not really. Uh, The Russians have captured 70 to 80 percent of the city, but Ukraine remains in the city, denying them 100 percent. And the reason why they're able to continue to remain in the city is the flanks around Bakhmut continue to hold. So it was looking months ago, it was looking like the Russians would encircle the city, but they couldn't do it. They haven't. They haven't been able to crack the defenses to get to Chasiv Yar. So more than likely, the Ukrainians have been doing deliberate pullbacks. Maybe every 48 hours, they just pull back one city block, leaving explosives and booby traps in the buildings so that when the Russians take that space, they they trigger them. I don't know. <laughs> but for an update uh, on what's going on in the city, here is a recent update from a Ukrainian defender. Працює з усього, що тільки можна, але наші мужні воїни тримаються і відбивають атаку, провели штурм, і їх дорога під нашим контролем. Слава Україні! So as long as Ukraine has been able to maintain this one road, this single supply line in and out of the city, they've decided to stay in the city in order to distract and stall the Russians, make them bleed. And if you've been watching my update videos, the last four or five months have just been brutal because we've all been waiting, waiting for Ukraine's next counteroffensive. As NATO-trained Ukrainian units return, their often rumored counteroffensive cannot come soon enough for those still at the front lines. So when we pull up the map and just zoom out, Let's not think building by building, block by block in Bakhmut. One battle does not make a war. But when you look at the entire front line, let's go ahead and go back in time three months. Let's go back to January 22nd. And those were the front lines. These were Russia's best attempts for their winter offensive to take Abdivka, Marinka, Bakhmut, and they couldn't do it. Russia is incapable of large-scale offensive operations. They're never going
going to take the entirety of the Donbass region. They're never going to take the city of Zaporizhia. This is why Russia is constantly talking about peace talks and going to the negotiating table. They want to freeze the conflict for a couple years, build up their strength, and then go back for more of Ukraine. But Ukraine's not going to fall for it. Here's an interesting headline. After a 25-day lull, Russia attacks Kyiv with kamikaze drones. So it's been over 25 days since Russia's last large-scale missile and drone attack. Russia's master plan the entirety of the winter was to freeze the Ukrainians into surrendering. And of course that didn't work, but they did waste billions of dollars on their best long-range precision weapons in order to destroy energy nodes and transformers that the Ukrainians just had replaced within a couple days or weeks. But Russia is going to keep up the appearances with the occasional kamikaze drone attack, but it does look like they're, they've abandoned their plan to go after Ukraine's energy grid. So here's a hilarious headline. A drunk Russian soldier rolled an S-400 missile launcher into a ditch. Apparently this happened in the Tula region, but this Russian soldier was driving really drunk. Blood alcohol content of 0.337. As a result of the rollover, the driver was injured, and I'm guessing there has to be at least some minor damage to the missile launcher. This next story is actually pretty sad. A fifth of Russian prisoners recruited to fight in Ukraine are currently HIV positive, with convicts promised antiviral drugs if they agree to fight. I do believe there's a lot of people in Russian prisons who have been imprisoned wrongfully, so it's pretty sad the kind of medical care and treatment they receive when they do go to prison. But the HIV AIDS epidemic in Russia is something that not a lot of people talk about. And Russia, I think, is in the top five countries in the world with HIV AIDS rates. It's really bad. And in response to the HIV crisis ballooning in Russia, I think about eight or nine years ago, the government just stopped testing and tracking people, or at least publicly making available that data. This is embarrassing for the Russian state, and rather than creating a society and a government and a healthcare system to address it, they're just choosing to ignore it. And a result of this is lots of people in the prison system are HIV positive, and the Wagner Group and now the Russian military are recruiting to send them to Ukraine. They are given ID bans stating they are HIV positive, but the fact that they were luring these convicts to the war zone with the promise of giving them antiviral drugs. Yep, that's pretty evil. So Russia is desperate for more soldiers. They need more bodies. And apparently students at three Moscow universities have reported receiving mobilization orders in mass, despite being legally exempted from conscription. So if you're wealthy enough and smart enough to get into a major Moscow university, the government doesn't conscript you. They don't force you to join the military. Perhaps this policy has changed and nobody told the students, but there are now rich kids at Moscow University currently panicking that the war they support, they might have to go and fight there themselves. Let's now talk about the good news for Ukraine, and Denmark and the Netherlands have agreed to donate 14 additional Leopard 2 tanks to Ukraine. Unfortunately, these aren't Leopard 2s from their existing inventories. They're going to be purchasing these brand new, and they'll be delivered sometime in early 2024. This is really good news. The United States has announced their Patriot missile battery has been delivered to Ukraine. So Germany's arrived last week, 
um, 200 or so Ukrainian defenders trained in the United States on this system. Each uh, missile battery, I think, is eight launchers with four tubes each, so they can fire 32 missiles without uh, needing to reload. So two of these systems will now be in place protecting the skies before their ground forces start advancing in the upcoming counteroffensive. The Minister of Defense of Latvia announced the decision to hand over to Ukraine all of their Stinger anti-aircraft missiles. Once again, the Baltics more than anyone know that if Russia somehow succeeds, they're next. So might as well give Ukraine everything they can to stop the Russians. And we've got news from Albania. Albania has canceled their visa-free entry program for the Russians. I'm guessing a lot of Russians fled to Albania and it's causing trouble for the locals. So thank you so much, Albania. Keep Russians inside of Russia until they change their government. Last couple feel-good clips I have for you. The first one is quite amazing. That right there is the best uh, pizza commercial I have ever seen. Final clip I have for you is from the Military Band of Operational Command East, uh, cheering and dancing somewhere in the Kherson region. A free people defending their land, sometimes you just gotta dance. That's all for this update video. Glory to Ukraine, glory to the heroes. If you found this video informative, give me a thumbs up. Best way to support the channel. Comments and questions, let me know down below. I love hearing from you guys. Till the next video, keep defending the truth, keep defending democracy.